But welcome, everybody. I want to uh, uh, welcome you to the U.S. Institute of Peace. Uh, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. Institute of Peace. And um, welcome, everyone, to a, a very important, um, probably sobering uh, event and, and a very f special film screening. Um, I want to thank, uh, in particular, the German Embassy um, and the Kurdistan Regional Government representation in the United States for partnering with us on this event. Uh, a very special and warm welcome uh, to the German Ambassador to the United States, uh, Ambassador uh, Emily Haber. Uh, and, uh, um, to members of the Iraqi embassy. Uh, we have a special guest with us, Minister uh, Safin Dezaye, who's the head of the Kurdistan Regional Government Department of Foreign Relations, who is happily visiting Washington this week. So thank you for putting this on your itinerary. And of course, our good friend, the Kurdistan Regional Government Representative, Bayan Sami Abdulrahman. Um, thank you, all of you, for your partnership, for helping to make this event uh, happened today um, with a special welcome to uh, Gwyn Roberts, who is the director and the producer of the film that we'll see. Um, so this is a very special opportunity. And his film, One Azidi Family versus ISIS, it captures the kind of unimaginable realities that many of us read about, uh, that so many Yazidis experienced under the brutality of ISIS. And while there was widespread cruelty and many, many were affected uh, by ISIS, the Yazidis, of course, were singled out for their faith and were victims of what can only be described as genocide. Um, this film helps us to understand and remember their stories uh, and to redouble our conviction to work for the kind of world where this won't happen. Um, U.S. Institute of Peace was founded by Congress 35 years ago, uh, specifically with the mission to prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict by working with partners around the world. And through our history, we've been very humbled and honored to work with the kind of very courageous men and women who are depicted in this film. We've worked in Iraq since 2003, and we have long partnered with the many religious communities that make up that very rich mosaic in Iraq, the Christians, the Shabak, of course, the Yazidis, and many others. And today, post-ISIS, we continue to work with those communities as they seek to heal and to facilitate their ability to return home. Um, I was in Iraq this past spring. Uh, I had the privilege of visiting the religious home of the Yazidis, the Lalish Temple, where I was uh, able to meet their spiritual leader, Baba Sheikh. Um, and of course, he courageously broke with tradition and welcomed the Yazidi women back to the community who had been captured by ISIS. And I met four of the women on my trip, and like so many Yazidi women, they survived the worst horrors perpetrated by ISIS. And to me, their stories just really demonstrated in a way that's hard to fathom, but how deep these wounds run um, and how long it will take them and really the entire community to recover from the devastation of ISIS. Um, of course, now more than five years after ISIS attacked Sinjar, there are still some 300,000 Yazidis who remain displaced who are eager to get home. So after the film, um, we will be able to have a facilitated discussion about these challenges and how the international community can help more Yazidis return home. Um, before I turn things over uh, to our next speaker, I just want to say that I know many of us uh, are watching very closely the, the current situation in Iraq, where the widespread demonstrations in Baghdad and the southern provinces have really underscored that some of the core grievances that gave rise to ISIS in the first place um, still need to be addressed. So this is a pivotal moment for Iraq. The protests demonstrate that people really do want an accountable non-sectarian government, and this is crucial to building lasting peace and stability in Iraq. And I take some hope that there is an intent for the protests to be peaceful with hopes that they can remain so. Um, with that, I'm really delighted to introduce someone whose government has been a leader in helping communities in Iraq recover from ISIS, um, the German ambassador to the United States, Emily Haber, 
Prior to her appointment as ambassador, uh, Ambassador Haber was deployed to the Federal Ministry of the Interior. She served as state secretary, um, and in that role, she oversaw security and migration at the height of the refugee crisis in Europe. So she knows these issues intimately and has been a real force, a positive force. Um, and the government of Germany continues to play a key role in the stabilization, uh, providing emergency aid and psychosocial support to the most vulnerable of victims. Uh, among the members of the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS, Germany follows the United States as the second largest donor. So we're quite honored to be able to partner uh, with the German Embassy to have you here with us today, Ambassador Haber. Please join me in welcoming her. Ms. Lindstrom, Excellencies, and Gwyn Roberts, first of all, thank you uh, that you made it possible for me to join you here today. And I've been tasked to introduce Gwyn Roberts, who has produced the documentary we're going to see now, and that is going to tell us the story of a human catastrophe by portraying one family. I haven't seen the film as yet. Um, but I'm looking very much forward to it. As Mrs. Lindstrom has mentioned, um, at the time when that happened, when the catastrophe unfolded, I was um, a state secretary in our um, interior ministry, and I, in fact, oversaw questions of security and questions of migration. And when we witnessed how ISIS overran the Sinjar Mountains, and wreaked havoc in Yazidi communities, Yazidi villages, Yazidi families, and over actually a rich and very ancient history, it had an immediate effect on us. Not only because actually we saw the echoes on German streets in cities like Hildesheim and Bremen, uh, where actually, and understa un understandably for many of my colleagues in the interior ministry, because as opposed to me, they hadn't been working in the foreign ministry before, un understandably for them, when Chechens suddenly attacked Kurds, they asked them, so what's happening here? These were the echoes of what happened, not in another world, but actually quite close to us. And perhaps uh, that made it possible for us to immediately confront the question, how, how can we help? Helping by welcoming Yazidi refugees or those who had, were lucky enough to escape uh, um, death and the catastrophe by welcoming them in Germany. I personally was involved in the effort of the federal state of Baden-Württemberg that welcomed many of them. Today, I believe we are the largest, uh, we have the largest Yazidi community in the world, 200,000. But it wasn't the only question we faced. We also discussed, is that the right, right way ahead? What can we do uh, to um, help uh, in uh, the ancestral areas where the Yazidi came from uh, between Nineveh and, uh, and Sinjar? What can we do to help uh, in, uh, in northern Iraq by um, building schools or kindergartens or rebuilding infrastructure and streets and sewers <coughs> or hospitals by supporting uh, the camps uh, where we try to help by setting up clinics and uh, procuring simple things like clean water uh, or uh, sanitation. I'm sure the film, I said it to the uh, producer before, um, will tell me a lot about mistakes we've always made. Uh, uh, we, we always, uh, we also made. If you do things, you make mistakes. Uh, but I'm just telling all of you this because I want to, you to understand that actually we were dedicated to, to good <laughs> and to help. Now, I'm looking forward to your film. Uh, uh, Gwyn Roberts has an extensive um, uh, experience in the region. I know that you've already uh, traveled uh, uh, the Kurdish region uh, as early as the uh, early 1970s, and you have trekked from the um, from uh, northern Syria through the Kurdish mountains to Iraq and then even Iran uh, in the early 1980s. And over many, many years, uh, you have covered uh, 
um, uh, uh, the Iraq uh, in uh, what you produced. You are an Emmy Award uh, um, uh, uh, winner, um, and uh, your work is well known. Uh, I think we'll, we're in for a true experience because I cannot think of a more powerful way to tell the story of what I call the human catastrophe um, by telling the story of what it meant to humans, to individual humans. I think we'll have a lasting effect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. Um, I must say that uh, the uh, my closeness to the, the story itself has made me realize what a fantastic contribution the German government has made to helping the Yazidis. It's quite exceptional. I just wouldn't wish that Britain had also done as much uh, to make a difference to their lives. So thank you very, very much indeed. It's a great honor to be here to speak to you. Uh, as you gather, my name is Gwyn Roberts. And as a journalist and filmmaker, I've been uh, covering Kurdistan since March 19. 74, and that was the beginning of the Kurdish uprising against Baghdad. Um, as I was there when the whole thing collapsed, and that was also horrendous, when uh, the Shah and Her Henry Kissinger withdrew support abruptly uh, from the Kurds, and they were left absolutely bereft. Now, this has become a recurring pattern in the whole story. Um, when I first traveled there, I was um, a correspondent for a correspondent, not a staff correspondent, but a freelance correspondent for the New York Times and the Financial Times. And in 1981, I began to uh, shoot my own films. And that was the beginning of a journey right across Kurdistan, uh, being shipped across the Tigris on a rub rubber tube, the inner tube of a lorry tire into Turkey and then clandestinely right across uh, the region. Seeing what Saddam Hussein had done to that region was quite phenomenal. You know, houses had been destroyed, uh, wells uh, concreted over, orchards absolutely reduced to nothing. And it was a very moving journey. I sort of still remember every few moments of that, of that journey. And, uh, but for me, it was, <laughs> Yeah, it was an awareness that Saddam was saying they'd actually sealed off hermetically the whole region. And then they were doing whatever they wanted to do to the Kurds. And that meant stripping them from their homes, moving them out of a 20 kilometer deep area, uh, banishing them to the south of Iraq. And it was an eye opener. I couldn't believe that this was actually happening. Anyway. Um, most, more recently, I mean, I've made many, many films about Kurdistan, but more recently, I founded the Kurdistan Memory Program, the KMP. Uh, our project has been running for about 12 years, and what we're seeking to do is to document the Kurdish history for the world. Um, the film, the data, and historical multimedia we're producing are the foundation of a new national historical archive that has been built in Kurdistan. Uh, this will be housed at the Kurdistan Museum in Erbil, which has been designed by the American architect Daniel Liebeskind, and we hope will be constructed in the coming years. Um, of course, because of my work with the KMP, I've been traveling the length and breadth of Iraqi Kurdistan with my team, most of them Kurds, I may say, and we've been interviewing everyday people and gathering testimony from victims of genocide. And so inevitably, the ISIS invasion of the Yazidi homeland in northwestern Iraq became a really important focus for this project. And the destruction of identity and the erasure of cultural heritage has been commonplace in Kurdistan over the centuries. To take you an example, during 1988, some 4,500 village, villages were reduced to rubble by the Iraqi army. There they produced the most incredible 
carpets, wonderful designs which stretch back thousands of years. These carpets have an individual language, totally wiped out. And that's what they did to them. They just destroyed their culture. Um, yet this process of destruction, dispossession, and cultural erasure is also a contemporary issue, as you see in our film tonight. Since 2000, ISIS, or Daesh, has destroyed the homes that we think more than 1.5 million people in Iraq and Syria. I mean, their surviving victims have experienced tra traumas that will last a lifetime. Our film tonight is about a Yazidi family who were captured by ISIS but who survived to tell their story. We visited their homeland in Sinjar in northwestern Iraq in January 2014, seven months before the ISIS invasion. Even then, this was considered a very dangerous place to visit. Al-Qaeda affiliates were operating there and seven years earlier had been responsible for one of the worst terrorist, terrorist attacks since 9-11, in which 800 Yazidis were killed. Uh, in Sinjar, we found a family who we later filmed over a period of years. They were just one, thousand, uh, they were just one of thousands of Yazidi families who, suff who suffered terribly under ISIS. These families are a timely reminder what a resurgent ISIS could do to minorities across Iraq and Syria. And I know there are estimates that there's a force of between 15 and 20,000 ISIS members now operating in the no man's land between uh, Kurdistan region and the Iraqi government. So we need to be aware that this is happening as I speak. Uh, as you will see in this film, these people are not just statistics. They are deeply human lives that are being torn apart by geopolitical events beyond their control. Earlier this year, we presented the film at the United Nations headquarters in New York. The then president of the UN Security Council, Christoph Heusken, made a comment in his speech at the event that has stayed with me. He said, what really marked the film out was that it focused on the fate of a single family. When we hear of the 65 million people that are refugees today, this is just a number, he said. But when we talk about 65 million refugees, we are really talking about 65 million individual fates. Right now, there are more than 17,000 refugees who have flooded into the Kurdish region, Kurdistan region following Turkey's recent invasion of northern Syria. If the situation worsens, and it probably will, these numbers will rise massively. I'll let the film speak for itself. But as you watch it, please consider that its subjects are real people who need and deserve our support. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, I, well, I think it will take me also a moment to uh, recover from uh, from this. Usually, I got back um, from Iraq two days ago, and usually coming back from the field and seeing the communities, uh, it's, all, it's always a load of emotions that I have to work through. But uh, then half the surge of emotions through the film uh, watching it for the third time, uh, I think it will show on my performance uh, uh, moderating this discussion, so I apologize um, in advance. Uh, my name is Sarhan Hamasaid. I'm the director of Middle East programs here at USIP, and I have uh, the honor to facilitate um, this segment of the program, a discussion uh, about the film. and. Um, and, uh, and what's uh, happening uh, in the Tuyazidi community. Uh, I have the honor uh, here to be joined uh, by uh, Mr. Gwyn Roberts, who is the, the filmmaker, the producer, and the director. 
um, you know, for one Yazidi family versus uh, ISIS, and which we just watched. And uh, we have the honor, and we've been joined by Ambassador Farid Yassin, Iraq's ambassador to the United States. And we are also joined by uh, Ms. Bayan Rahman, the representative of the Kurdistan Regional Government uh, to the United States. Um, I'll start with um, uh, uh, talking to Mr. Uh, Roberts and the format of the discussion. Uh, I'll ask him some questions, then uh, I'll follow it up with um, a couple of questions to the ambassador and uh, 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 Representative Rahman, and then we'll open it up uh, for discussion um, for uh, questions from uh, from you all. And we have mic runners uh, on both sides of the of the room. Uh, Mr. Roberts, um, thank you very much for this very powerful film. And thank you for taking the time to, ta to come uh, such a long way um, to be with us, uh, coming from uh, the UK, I believe, uh, to the, coming today. And uh, uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, I really like this film uh, for many reasons. Um, it is, I mean, there is power. Excuse there's power, uh, I mean, something is also mentioned, alluded to, there's power to saying, for example, in Iraq, uh, the conflict produced five million people, uh, acts of genocide, the, uh, uh, and uh, a lot of displacements and thousands of people killed. Um, but at some point, people get numb uh, to this no those numbers and they just, they become numbers. Uh, and in our uh, line of work, I usually try with words express uh, what happened to those communities. I use terms like uh, ISIS shredded um, the fabric of society or ISIS shattered uh, the, the, the sense of community like you, sh you break glass just to try to, to portray an image. Uh, but what you depicted so powerfully directly through the stories of these people, uh, no words but their words can, can express. So uh, truly, thank you uh, for doing that. You've taken us um, for a deep dive um, and uh, showing us the cost of conflict and humanized, uh, and giving us the humanizing in the face of that, uh, taking us to, a, to really a molecule. Uh, and in that molecule, you see a world of pain. And if that's an appropriate uh, term to use, a world of pain for each individual of that family and a world of pain uh, for the family as, as a unit. Um, uh, and uh, it, it just shows uh, the, the, the range of issues that the region, this, that region suffered in terms of loss of life, uh, the sa surviving sexual slavery, displacement, and uh, many other forms of um, human suffering. So perhaps staying with the family, I, if I can start with, um, do you have any updates about the family that you can share um, since uh, you filmed uh, the film? Well, it, it, thank you very much for your uh, comments. Um, it was, I must say, an extremely difficult film to make, uh, not least because initially we were extremely worried about were we um, crossing red lines in terms of the way we treated um, their experiences at the hands of ISIS. And so initially you will see a lot of shots of, of the girls very close up and you can't identify them. But what we did was to keep very close to the family and ask them all the way through, you know, for the permission, what did they want to do? Did they want us to continue? And the message was loud and clear. They wanted us to continue and to tell their story. So it was very, very important to have their backing to do this. Um, but it was a difficult film to make, and I think everyone involved in it, Niraj, for example, you remember the time you were doing the translation of their, their, um, what they said, just how difficult it was to deal with. Everyone in the edit and so on were in tears a lot of the time. Now, the, the family seems to be getting on quite well. Um, we, from time to time, let them know that the film is, it, it was shown on the BBC a number of times. Um, I've yet to let them know that it was going to be shown today. But we, we have contact through our office in Erbil with them in Stuttgart, because uh, I don't speak Kurdish, so uh, it has to go through Kurdish speakers. Um, but they seem to be doing well. And the thing that really heartened me was the children, because they'd suffered terribly. And they 
coming out of it so positively, you know, and you saw the benefits of what you did by bringing them to Germany and the fact that they can have a normal life in the schools, you know, with other children was fantastic. I'm um, just that is so beneficial to their recovery. Uh, I'm sure they will thank you very, very much from the bottom of their hearts for allowing it to happen. Uh, thank you. So. One of the striking things about the family and um, uh, the Yazidi community is that these people have not been combatants. The Yazidi community, they have not been party to the conflict. They were not fighting. They did not have a, f a conflict of their own. So, and yet they have uh, suffered um, uh, really um, uh, uh, heinous crimes. Um, and you, we see the, their tragic stories. Um, but. I mean, you've covered uh, uh, that region. So is the story of the Chetto family a unique story? And if I can ask you, since then, um, have you gone back to the Sinjar area or engaged with the community? What update can you give us uh, from what you filmed to where you see the situation of the Yazidi as a community? Well, I've not gone back to the Sinjar region because it's quite unstable and quite dangerous. Uh, a lot of it has been destroyed. And um, so sending them back to that area is, it seems to me, a hopeless quest, really, because what are they going back to? What actually happened, or seems to have happened, is that the villages around them, um, where there were supporters of ISIS, still have supporters of ISIS. They've gone back after ISIS collapsed to their villages. And what could happen again is that they come out and rejoin ISIS if it reforms, as we think it is reforming. Uh, and that could, you know, it would be not a good idea for them to go back. There'd be horrendous risks. And there's political instability in that region as well. So what was the first question was... Is their story unique? It, it's not unique. Um, the intensity of what happened, you know, with six girls, uh, two being killed when they tried to flee, and four in captivity, and then them being rescued by their brother, effectively, and also by contributions from the Yazidi community in Germany. Um, it doesn't... It does repeat itself, but not quite in that, in that way. I mean, lots of people have suffered terribly, have been brought out of captivity, and you know, have been deeply traumatized. So yeah, no, it's not unique, but in the intensity with which that family experienced, the number of children involved, I think it possibly is unique. So, um I mean, if we broaden uh, this a little bit, I mean, you've covered, as it was said uh, earlier by the introduction by Ambas uh, Ambassador Haber and uh, 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 others, uh, you've been covering, and you, your comments, you've been covering the region um, for a long time. Uh, you've covered different governments, different systems, different parts of the country. And um, this is a region that unfortunately does not have a, uh, is not uh, short on a supply of painful stories. And I remember some of my own stories living uh, in the Kurdistan region when the Enfal happened. I remember my own stories in the 1996 translating similar kind of stories um, uh, um, about uh, the survivors. And uh, I have stories from my work as a professional uh, of mass killings and genocide uh, against the Yazidis, the Christians, and mass killing against others uh, in other parts of Iraq. Again, th so this seems like, like cycles of violence that bleed uh, uh, into each other. And you've covered them from, uh, from different angles. I wanted to get your thoughts uh, on that. And if you have any thoughts of, from your observations, what could help break those cycles? Well, the main difference in this case is that there's been enormous publicity, um, publicizing what's happened to the Yazidis. And whereas before, uh, I mentioned uh, in my initial comments about uh, you know being floated across the Tigris from Turkey in, uh, from uh, Syria into Turkey and then crossing into uh, Iraq. What had happened was that the area was completely hermetically sealed. Horrible things were happening, and no one found out about it. Then when we start going into the villages now, 
and uh, doing effectively historical journalism, interviewing people and ask them, what happened to you personally? What can you tell us about your experience? And repeating the interviews uh, ad infinitum right across the Kurdish regions. And you begin to realize that what happened to ISIS happened, in, uh, happened to the Yazidis, happened equally to the Kurds generally across the Kurdish region. I mean, um, as I said, there were 45,000 villages, or 4,500 villages destroyed, you know. Their whole cultural uh, community of their textiles wiped out and people taken off and shot and killed in mass graves. I mean, uh, mass executions. And what was interesting, there were occasional survivors of these executions who told in grim detail what had happened. This is uh, an episode in Iraq's history that has largely gone, it's not, it's not gone untold, but it's been forgotten about. And people like to walk away from it. And what we're trying to do is actually, um, is try and bring it alive with interviews, with film, with archive footage, and so on, to make people aware that this has happened. It's not, what's happening to ISIS is, is not a new experience at all. And there are cycles of violence in Iraq, which of course will repeat themselves. Um, it's a matter of, of uh, th there's been no process of truth and reconciliation, as there was, say, in Sierra Leone. It, it's sort of desperately needed, so people come to terms with what has happened. And until there is, there's no, there's no solution to this, because in the future, I would pr predict there will be recurrences of this sort of behavior. It may involve ISIS, it may involve other sectors of the Iraqi community. Well, thank you. So um, with that, I transition to, I mean, to ask you about I mean, trauma and resilience. Um, in some of the conversations and videos of interviews, um, I've seen you talk about uh, trauma. And um, uh, one thing that uh, stuck with me, um, another documentary that I have seen that features um, the, uh, the journalist Michael Weir, um, uh, he titled the, the film, uh, Only the Dead See the War, the End of War. Uh, basically, his, their way of saying that uh, the issue of trauma has lasting effects and those things stay with you. And uh, we, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, and we've seen us, uh, the, the, the Cheto family survive, and we, um, as you mentioned earlier, that the, the, you chose to give us an uplifting, sort of uplifting yeah. um, uh, ending there. So I wanted to get your thoughts on on, uh, trauma and resilience in the context that you've worked with? In, in this project, we've interviewed countless uh, survivors of Anfal and of ISIS and so on. And trauma is something that we experience, you know, the people's trauma just comes at you. And trauma is quite extraordinary because it's not something that the person tells you and you can shield yourself behind your journalistic, you know, professional uh, shield. It comes through that shield. If you, to, to understand what they've been through, you've got to empathize. You've got to understand and feel a little bit of what has happened to them. And I can tell you that it's like having a wire extended between you and them. And it's like a live current at times coming along that wire. And it is, it's painful. So there's, there's a sort of limit to the amount of times you can do this. Now, um, I remember once, Rania talking um, to a guy who'd been in Balasan when it was gassed in 1987. And he'd been with his father. He'd been blinded. And he was taken, they were taken to a bus, and they were going to be taken by the Iraqis to, uh, to Ebil for treatment. And he was taken with his father. And he couldn't see anything. And at one point, his father said to him, son, it's all over. He was being dragged off by the guards. And they were separated. He, he never saw his father after that. And he told the story, and he broke down. And I tell you, I broke down with him. And throughout the day, and throughout the next day, I had a searing headache. You know, it, you just can't deal with these stories and think it's it's 
happening there and it doesn't affect me. It affects you every single time. <laughs> So trauma is a thing, I don't think there will be much done in terms of helping uh, survivors of uh, Anfal recover from what's, what's befallen them, you know, what they've experienced. But it would seem to me you will have a lot of damaged people. You will have a lot of brutalized people as well. This doesn't make you a nice person if you've been right through this. It, it's damaging. But there's been no attempt, I think, or very limited attempt to actually help people resolve mental health problems that have been brought on by, by the way they've been treated. I mean, I could go on and on about trauma. It's, uh, it's fascinating, but it's also painful. Um, thank you. So um, I know uh, you are not a policymaker, but you have um, see, you've uh, you've seen um, the depth uh, and 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 and. Uh, and the situation of people that probably policymakers could spend a lifetime and they will not come close uh, to that pain and to the story um, uh, of those people. Um, in this particular context of, uh, of the Yazidis, and uh, they count, I think, over 70 rounds of genocide in their, yeah. in their history, uh, and so the, there are the, the, the cycle of refreshing their wound uh, seems to, to, to continue. But uh, coming to the policy lane, I mean, from your observations, from your work, um, do you have any particular things that you would like to flag for this audience or for the international community as advice or as asks or as a call of action of sorts? I, I think the difficulty with you know the divisions within the Kurds that you know these divisions are being augmented very often by the big players um, in the region, and it's very very difficult to do anything unless there is a unity amongst the Kurds and that they're encouraged to work very closely together, to forget uh, the reasons why divisions have uh, have arisen. And they, they develop a sort of inner unity amongst themselves. It's been an age-long problem with the Kurds um, where they, they were fighting for the Ottoman Empire or fucking, uh, fighting with the Persians, with the Safavids. They've always been used against each other. It's been one persistent and uh, characteristic of what's happened in the Kurdish areas for hundreds of years. And it's that, for me, it's the realization the Kurds themselves have to make that they cannot and should not be divided because the reasons for being Kurdish are so strong that to allow themselves to be divided is an utter, utter mistake. And it, this continual division of the Kurds means that they cannot, they won't achieve anything. Once they achieve unity, uh, that will, there will be a huge difference. But it also means that reconciliation in that region has to be vastly improved. I mean, it's one community against the other. And whether it's Iraq, whether it's Iran, Turkey, you can't have these horrible, horrible divisions. You can't, for example, I mean, one of the things that we're looking at in this project is what's been happening with Arabization in the Iraqi Kurdish regions. You don't need to look very far, and you see what is planned for the northern Syrian regions, where Kurdish uh, areas where people have been Arabized, been kicked out of those areas, are now going to be further um, depopulated, and Arabs who fled to Turkey are going to be brought into there. Is that a solution? That just is going to cement deep, deep divisions within these communities. You just can't continue doing that. Arabization, uh, Anfal was in fact Arabization. People were driven out of their homes and homes destroyed. Okay, they've now repopulated some of the areas. But to have this happening in Syria on equal scale is crazy. But no one is saying, none of the, the, the community, the um, outside community is saying anything about it. How can you just accept that a leader decides you're going to move all these people out and you're going to bring all these people in? When the original inhabitants have lived there for, for, we don't know how long, but for a long, long time. And this is cruelty gone berserk. Sorry, I'm, I'm going on and on now. Yeah. Thank
Thank you. So I would like to bring in uh, Ambassador Yassin and uh, Mr. Rahman, uh, basically on um, to start the conversation with them, two, two points. I think both uh, as representatives of the government of Iraq um, and the Kurdistan regional government, uh, uh, ISIS displays these people, the concern, the people talk about the concern and uh, uh, of ISIS still being there. So I want to put uh, a twofold uh, question. One, in terms of the, uh, the film, um, if you have any uh, comments that you would particularly want to share, but uh, uh, then uh, if I ask you to speak about the threat of ISIS, uh, uh, what's the, the assessment uh, of that threat from the perspective of the government of Iraq and the Kurdistan regional government? And if I start with you, Ambassador Yassin. Well, the first thing I want to say is thank you, Gwen, because this gentleman has been doing this for quite a number of years, putting his life at risk to bring out stories that need to be told. Um, uh, Dr. Sahang mentioned the cycle of violence we've had in Iraq. Practically to the day, 10 years ago, um, we got a visit from Eric Schmidt to Baghdad, who met with Hoshar Zabari. And he asked us a question. He said, what is the worst thing that Saddam left you? And uh, we all had our own answer. Mine was the quelling of the uprising. Hoshiar's was the Anfal, and others was the Iran-Iraq war. Um, eventually, it dawned us, uh, on us that uh, Saddam's worst legacy is that he left us a choice of worst legacies. But if that question were asked in August of two th or September of 2014, what is the worst thing that has fallen on Iraq, then it's the plight of the Yazidis. And there's no question that this was the worst thing that we have seen. And I have, I'm not speaking out of uh, abstract knowledge. I spent a couple of years of my life documenting disappeared uh, and foul victims. And like you said, it's something that gets at you. I think had I not stopped, I would have had a, a massive depression, you know, going through thousands of names of young people who, who disappear, uh, getting their mothers to donate pictures of their sons so that you can document them. It's something that grips at you. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we do is not forget. And that's where I think your work is really, really important. And we need to do, like you said, an oral history, not only in Iraq, in Kurdistan, in the neighboring countries, but also amongst the uh, far-flung uh, Yazidi population, there's something that you have to know, is that the Kurds in general, um, forgive me for speaking, they're still my countrymen, uh, but especially the Yazidis are very much attached to their land. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a religious attachment. They would save money so that if they died in exile, they would be sent back to be buried there. And one of the most telling things in the development of the Yazidi community in this country is that they consecrated land in the state of Nebraska to, to, make, to make a cemetery for themselves in it. This is, this is a historic decision for a community like this. So like I said, we have to remember. Then we have to make sure that this does not happen again. And all measures, use all measures that you can, military, intelligence, uh, economic, uh, international, local, tribal, cultural, nothing can be spared to prevent this from happening again. Um, it would be, it, it is a blot on Iraq's history that something like this has happened. Uh, I would be really ashamed if it were to happen again, even in, in smaller measure. Um, then there is something else to be done. We have to take care of the survivors. And this is not an easy thing. ISIS survivors, not only the Yazidis, but more generally, ISIS survivors are of all sorts. And don't forget, there are children of these communities who were taken and brainwashed and turned into killing machines by, by ISIS. How do you deal with that? I mean, I really don't know, but how do we deal with that? I think one has to go back to what the Nazis did 
to see what how the allies dealt with this to see whether we could come up with solutions that we could be that we could implement on a national scale um, and then like you said there is the issue of reconciliation but before that there is the issue of justice and that is something that is being debated at the highest level you know what to do with the ISIS terrorists that did this uh, I hope and, and 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 pray that we deal with this issue with wisdom um, uh, and yes with 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 compassion for the victims but with with wisdom and intelligence so that we can make sure that it never 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 happens again and the threat of ISIS is your assessment you have an assessment of where the threat of ISIS at the moment is it is not zero it is not zero they uh, um, they have been vanquished territorially but they have sleeper cells, and there are bands roving in sparse areas of Iraq that we need to uh, track and control. And then eventually, uh, one has to bear this in mind, this, at the basis, is an ideological thing. And we have to point out, to prove, to make sure that people know that this is an ideology that is nothing but pure evil. Thank you, Ambassador. So I'll uh, um, move to uh, Ms. Rahman, but if you have your questions, r raise your hands and I'll take note and I'll, I'll come to you after. Uh, Bayan Khan, please. Uh, well, first, uh, I'd like to thank USIP and uh, the Embassy of Germany and the German Ambassador uh, for hosting this. I think it's excellent. And Gwyn, we've known you a very long time. Thank you for all the work that you've done and especially for this film. And thank you, Ambassador, for being here. I also want to point out that we have some Yazidi friends in the audience, and uh, you're very welcome. And I, I can imagine how painful this film was for you, as it is for all of us. Um, I'll address your question in a moment, if I may, but I want to say that I've seen this film several times. I cry every time. I'm hopeless. Um, and every time I see new things, Gwyn, and one of the things I noticed this time, and it's so obvious, I don't know why I didn't notice it before, the, the little girl from the Chetto family, when the family is displaced and they're all talking about what happened to their father, how he died, and they were sitting by the body, and the ISIS um, fighters were beating the children and so on, the, the little girl never spoke. She never spoke. The only time she spoke is when she was in Germany, and she found her voice, and she talked about the fun things that she does, as any child her age should. And I think that that moment or that realization, for me anyway, speaks volumes. I think the Yazidis have felt that they've had no voice. And I hope that if there's any silver lining in this horrendous tragedy of genocide, it is that they have found their voice. And I want to thank anyone, any government, any people, any NGO, any human being that has helped the Yazidis, because what they've been through is just unspeakable. To answer your question about ISIS, um, from the KRG's perspective, we are very concerned about ISIS. Um, we believe there are 15 to 20,000 ISIS fighters between Syria and Iraq. Uh, we're concerned that some of the ISIS fighters uh, escaped the jails or detention camps in Syria when there was a recent incursion by Turkey and a withdrawal backwards or, I don't know, withdrawal and then an unwithdrawal by the US. In that confusion or in that moment, some ISIS fighters did escape. Um, it only takes one suicide bomber to blow up a room this size. So when people say, oh, it's only 100, I'm sorry, that's a lot of death and destruction that can be created. Um, also, um, ISIS is now a global phenomena. Uh, it's not just in Iraq and Syria. I do believe that wherever we are in the world, we shouldn't think that we're immune. As uh, His Excellency the Ambassador said, the ideology is still there. And we haven't really, I think, um, 
as a community, a world community, we haven't successfully come up with a counter narrative. To us, their narrative is so crazy, we can't understand how anyone would fall for it, but people do, and especially young people, vulnerable people, angry people, marginalized. We need to find a counter narrative that deals with that, and I think that's where we are. That's the point where we can continue to fight ISIS militarily, and we need to do that, but we really need to also think about the counter narrative that will absolutely defeat their ideas. Ideology. Sure. I actually wanted to thank uh, Gwen for doing one thing that I uh, thought stood out in this movie, and that's the innate dignity of these people. You brought that out in a way uh, that uh, cop smacks you. Um, I'm, when I was watching this movie, I was trying to think of similar experiences I had went back many, many years ago uh, watching, it was as a graduate student, I watched this movie called uh, The Killing Fields. Uh, these were the killing, the real killing, he used that word, uh, that, that title I milked some time ago. But these were killing fields, and I hope we never have killing fields in Iraq again. Actually, we, uh, in 19, sorry, in 91 we did a field, <coughs> film. Which is called the Killing Fields in in it was put on PBS with Kenan Makia, yeah. yeah. So I'll take um, a couple of questions. Uh, one here in front. Yes, please. Thank you. My name is Mustafa Kesri, and I have been working on this situation in Iraq and elsewhere. I think the fundamental question that we need to ask is not only about Daesh, but also to, to ask, can the political culture in the region generate institutions, um, entities that perfect that, that is capable of you know, committing such atrocities. If you look at the political history of the region in the past 100 years, with the Armenian genocide, with the ethnic cleansing of the Greeks, later on I spent six months investigating Anfal operations at the beginning of the 90s with Human Rights Watch, and then with United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, wherever you go in the world, you see Yazidis, Kurds, you know, victims. And I hope that's the last time that you know, we see such atrocities you know, against the Kurds, Yazidi minorities and so to speak others. But I hope that you know this film, which was excellent, provokes in us that uh, what causes these institutions to emerge at the first place? Once in the case of Saddam Hussein, it was not in the name of religion. It was basically Saddam was not a religious, uh, you know, did not have a religious government. In any case, I think that you know we examine the political culture which precipitates, you know, such such atro atrocious, you know, institutions, and particularly and also against ethnic and religious minorities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, yeah, can I? Yeah, we'll sure. take another one and then. Yeah. yeah so th the back, and uh, if I may ask. Um, uh, to state your name, and if you have a question, you're directing it to one of the panelists, please state that. I'm Atham Coburn from American University, Washington College of Law. Thank you, USIP, for this uh, uh, great opportunity bringing uh, so many people uh, under one roof. Uh, my question is to Ambassador Yassin. Thank you for your earlier presentation. Uh, Ambassador Yassin, as you might recall, um, in the legal adjudication of uh, certain figures of the Ba'ath regime, uh, first and foremost Saddam Hussein and uh, Chemical Ali, against all odds and very strong recommendations by the international legal community not to educate them at national jurisdiction but sort of create a ad hoc international tribunal as was the case for the crimes the Khmer Rouge committed uh, the US or in Yugoslavia or Rwanda. My question to you is, is your government currently considering in adjudicating ISIS fighters at national level and thereby repeating the mistakes because it seems that Iraq does not have the legal capacities to deal um, with, the, well, with the legal cases? Or does it consider in reaching out and establishing a uh, ad hoc international tribunal. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll take one, sorry, one more question and then we'll get uh, to all the, those uh, in the interest of time. Yes, please. Um, good afternoon. My name is Arlene Harrison. 
I'm a graduate student at Seton Hall University School of Diplomacy. I have a question about a statement that you made earlier about the importance of the Kurds unifying. And my question is, could the exodus, the mass exodus of the Syrian Kurds into Iraqi Kurdistan be a silver lining of sorts from the standpoint of eventual unification? Thank you. So start with you, uh, Gwen, uh, on the political. Yeah, the, I, I just feel that um, this cycle will continue. Because what happens, I think, you know, I'm not a, a real expert on this, but is, is that the societies, and not only the Kurdish society, but also Iraqi societies, become more and more brutalized. And it becomes very difficult to find a way out of this. I don't quite know how you break, break that line. Um, I mean, the Kurds have it. The it, it just it seems to me. I don't understand what the process would need to be to bring a halt to it. It's all right having lofty words and saying yes, we need reconciliation and and so on. It doesn't work. There needs to be some a definite. Um, period of sort of, conval I don't quite know, convalescence. It seems almost impossible. It's almost for me as if the region is damned to repeat itself all over again. And you mentioned with the Yazidis, I mean, there seem to have been 70 or more genocides. I mean, that's just incredible. And it's still happening. So what? what's wrong with the Yazidis? Now, I can tell you that even in Kurdistan, there was a lot of discrimination against the Yazidis. So Kurds themselves need to identify what they think of the Yazidi community and come to terms with the bad thoughts that they have, but also from the Yazidi side as well. There's quite a painful process, I think, involved. Anyway, sorry. And to the last question about unifying the Kurds, do you have a comment on that? Is, is the Syrian... <laughs> I think the whole unity thing is very, very complex. I think Bayern is better qualified than I am to, to answer that as a politician. Okay. Ambassador Yassin on the tribunal question. Um, this is a very topical question. It's being discussed. It was discussed at the General Assembly in the United Nations. And it was recently discussed as an anti-ISIS uh, conference just recently. Uh, the position of the Iraqi government is the following. We will take in Iraqi uh, ISIS fighters and we will judge them. We will take in also Iraqis who are relatives of ISIS uh, fighters, not to judge them, but to see whether we can reintegrate them in, in ways that have been done before. The example of Colombia stands out. You know, that it's, it's a long process, very costly process. What is at issue between the different countries is what to do with foreign fighters. And there are many, uh, several thousand coming from more than 50 countries. Um, our position is that this, is, uh, this should be dealt with by their home states. Some countries have argued that they should be judged near where the cri their crimes were committed. Uh, but in terms of the capacities of the Iraqi state, this is a really, really difficult thing to do. Imagine, for example, uh, some ISIS fighter who is responsible for killing, I don't know, God, God knows how many people, and he gets judged and then assuming we won't be able to use the death penalty, he gets his successive uh, uh, term, three terms of 30 years each. Who's going to deal with that? Where will you put him? Uh, it's um, it, from a just justice point of view, from a logistical point of view, it's really, really difficult. Uh, one example that I could mention is, is a German case where now you have uh, invoked uh, universal jurisdiction to um, apply the, to, uh, to apply German laws to tortioners uh, in, in Syria. Could this be extended to uh, ISIS fighters? I don't know. That's a question for the legal experts to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Ben. Thank you for what you've done. This was wonderful. Uh, so the question about uh, Kurdish unity or unification, I should uh, say that His Excellency Sefin Dezay, the KRG uh, head of foreign relations is here, so perhaps uh, he has a better answer. I'll have a go, but you're welcome to, 
correct. <laughs> oh, yes. So I think there are two levels of unity or unification we can talk about when we talk about the Kurds. First, there are the four borders or the four countries that we've been divided into, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. And uh, I always like to boast that I have relatives in all four parts of Kurdistan. Um, Maybe it's a dream for Kurds that all four parts will unify, but it's very, very unrealistic. Um, but that's maybe something that people dream about and write poems about. Um, but the other kind of unity, and I think perhaps this is what Gwyn was referring to, is more internal unity. Um, he's right, sadly, uh, and I've said this before in public as well, our disunity is actually our worst enemy. Uh, we have, uh, on the one hand, we have in Iraqi Kurdistan a, a healthy level of democracy. Of course, it can always be improved. But we have a parliament, we have uh, different parties. Uh, the elections are uh, contested very uh, what's the word, in a lively way. Um, we have elections uh, and so on. Um, but we also have a level of disunity that undermines our position, whether it's uh, within Iraq, whether it's on an international platform. And I agree with Gwyn and many other friends and many of us Kurds who believe this. We need to be much more united um, because the Kurds are are ethnically cleansed. We are the victims of genocide. Um, we are the victims in the killing fields in many parts of the world, and it doesn't seem to come to an end. So I think uh, unity has to be our way forward. If I may just add one thing. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is cultural erasure. And this has been, in many instances, systematic. So it's hardly surprising that Kurds are disunited. When their language has been attacked, their uh, art has been attacked, their music, their dancing, everything at various stages has been an attempt to actually try and erase it. And is it surprising that uh, there are problems about unity? The most fundamental thing about being Kurdish is the Kurdish culture, which is really strong. But if countries around you have been trying to, to banish it, to, to destroy it, then that will have a, a knock-on effect. Culture is at the heart of the problem. Um, there is a new development uh, that didn't exist even 20 or 30 years ago, and that is the issue of the diaspora. We now have, um, I'm, I'm speaking from an Iraqi perspective, a very important and growing Iraqi diaspora, and of course a very important and growing um, Kurdish diaspora, and uh, Bayan and I are you know, members of each. You know, so, so I think one way of trying to resolve these issues and, and, and tamp down on differences and to try to get some sort of common cause going along is to see whether we can further integrate uh, and bring together the various diasporas with their home countries uh, to see whether we can feed off each other in in, in, a, in a sort of virtuous cycle that would help avoid er erasure and enrich uh, the cultures that we that we uh, that we originally came from um, thank you. Unfortunately, we have um, come to the end of our time and probably we've uh, passed it by, by a few minutes. I mean, as the film uh, is showing us, has shown us this conversation, uh, the earlier remarks, uh, and what, that we see, what we see from the work of uh, USIP on the ground, the work of other organizations, uh, the work is not done. Uh, the the, the 300,000 people still displaced, unable to go uh, home, uh, and uh, uh, all the challenges that we are uh, facing. Um, it is a true testament that the work is not done, and the fact. Uh, 
uh, I think that we need to recognize that even the act of genocide is not complete because um, the ISIS may have been removed uh, as a in terms of uh, 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 holding territory, but the effect of what they have done did not stop with the killings and the displacement. Right now, with the, those people displaced, their future is still uncertain. And I coming back uh, from the region, uh, there is even an, a, a yet another a layer of complexity where the, uh, the especially the people of Sinjar and uh, the surrounding areas are concerned about the developments in Turkey and if, if, if the if Turkish uh, incursion could happen and destabilize their area further. So this work uh, is not done and it is important for us uh, to continue. Uh, in closing, I would like to thanks again, uh, to express my thanks again to the German Embassy and the, to the Kurdistan Regional Government uh, for um, uh, partnering with us to co-sponsor this uh, event. And I would like to thank Ambassador Yassin and Representative uh, Abdurrahman for their time and uh, for their comments. But really special thanks uh, to you, uh, Mr. Roberts, for uh, the excellent film, for um, traveling such a long distance um, uh, to uh, to be with, you, uh, with us today, uh, for the rich comments, but most importantly, uh, for, this, for the service of capturing the tragedy uh, of, of this family and what these communities um, are going through. Uh, you don't get that kind of quality um, uh, every day. I think the movie uh, and the film uh, ha was rich in content that will stay with us, and uh, it, it, it has plenty of material for all of us to unpack and process and see what we can do uh, to help uh, the, the, the families like the Chato family, uh, communities like the Ezidi uh, community, and, uh, and victims of conflict and, uh, and, and extremism in general. Um, so. Uh, uh, I appreciate that you stayed with us at this uh, late hour, so please thank me, uh, join me in thanking um, uh, uh, the, the, our, our panelists today.